as we saw uh, God's people in the time of Isaiah, um, where even in their captivity, uh, in their pain, in the midst of their affliction and suffering, uh, that was, by the way, caused by their own unfaithfulness, uh, by their own disobedience. Uh, we see in Isaiah 43, and uh, particularly uh, in the verses 1 through uh, 17, that God gave them comfort. He gave them assurance. Uh, those people that he had created those people who he had formed and chosen uh, of his promise of their redemption, of their deliverance. Amen, somebody. Isn't it wonderful to know that uh, even in our foolishness, God still loves us? Amen. So he gave them uh, reassurance, again, of uh, his promise to redeem them, to deliver them. And he did this, as we pointed out this morning, uh, by bringing to their own remembrance uh, as they were witnesses of his goodness. Amen, somebody. Um, of who he is. That he is the only true God and the only Savior. Uh, and he had proven that from the many things, uh, the many former things that he had done, and in particular, uh, how he had delivered them from the bondage of Egypt and how he had delivered them from Egypt even at the Red Sea. And from Isaiah 43, in particular, eight, verses 18 and 19, uh, he tells them not to remember, notice, uh, not to remember the former things. He wants them not to remember what he had did at the Red Sea. And we ask the question, of why? Why would he not want them to uh, remember, well, we pointed out this morning is that he not it's not that he didn't want them uh, to remember or forget about what he's done, but more more importantly, he didn't want them to dwell on that. Amen, somebody. And uh, the reason why he didn't want them to dwell on what he had did at the Red Sea, because he says in verse 19 that he will do a new thing. Amen, somebody. Uh, so much greater that in comparison uh, to what he had did at the Red Sea, uh, they would forget about that. Amen, somebody. Uh, so, uh, again, we understand from this morning uh, that the language in those two verses points out uh, two fulfillments. Number one uh, being uh, that uh, God will be faithful in delivering them from Babylonian captivity. And he would do such in a more spectacular way than ever before. In other words, what he would do in delivering them uh, from Babylonian captivity would cause them to not dwell on what he had did at the Red Sea because it would be so much greater. But secondly, and more importantly, and I pray that uh, we really got the message from this this morning is, uh, not only uh, does those two verses point out uh, God's faithful promise uh, to deliver them and redeem them from Babylonian captivity, uh, but the other new thing, the greatest thing, uh, the more wonderful thing, uh, would be the redemption and deliverance uh, from captivity, not from a nation, but uh, the new thing speaks to the fact that the coming Messiah would redeem and deliver them and all men from the bondage of sin and death. In other words, the new thing that God was going to do uh, that will pale in comparison to anything else uh, was in the coming of his only begotten son. And we uh, pointed that out, and we showed that by the scriptures uh, this morning, his only begotten son, Jesus the Christ. And as I said this morning, I'll say again this afternoon, uh, when I really personally take note of those scriptures and what God was 
uh, saying that he was going to do. It reminds me of our beautiful sisters and uh, how they give the phrase, won't he do it? Amen, somebody. And we need to understand that the message, uh, again, for us today is uh, not only won't he do it, uh, but in the fact that he's already done it. Is that all right? He's already done it. Uh, but again, the issue uh, that you and I at times today even struggle with even today uh, is that we say to ourselves, I know he can do it, uh, but will he do it for me? Um, and again, I just encourage uh, you, uh, as I said this morning, that God's love for you and I is not based upon our worthiness to receive it, uh, but solely upon his goodness to give it. Let me say that again. God's love is not based upon our worthiness uh, to receive it, but solely upon his goodness uh, to give it. And therefore, because uh, oftentimes we uh, define ourselves uh, by the things of this life, uh, you and I have a tendency uh, to focus on, notice, uh, what has happened to us. Amen, somebody. And don't think for one minute that the devil doesn't know that. Because he wants us to focus on what has happened to us. Things that uh, may not be fair. Things that may not be just. Uh, so we have a tendency to focus on uh, not only what has happened to us, but we also have a tendency to focus on what we don't have in comparison to other people. We also not only focus on uh, what has happened to us and what we don't have, but we also focus on who we are not. Amen, somebody. And we focus on all of these things, including more than that. We focus on those things as opposed to what God has already done. Did y'all get that? We focus on what has happened to us. We focus on what we don't have. We focus on who we are not as opposed to what God has already done. And again, what God has already done is the greatest thing that can ever happen to us in life. The greatest thing that we uh, search high and low for, for fulfillment in things of this life, God has already done. And sometimes it takes us, as I always say, it takes us a lifetime of disappointment. It takes us a lifetime of frustration and seeking fulfillment and seeking pleasure and seeking acceptance in any and everything when we have it already in God. And this is why Colossians chapter 3 and the verses 1 through 4 says this. Notice. Colossians chapter 3 and the verses 1 through 4 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Is that all right? The question tonight for us in the body of Christ is, have you been raised with Christ? Have you been raised with Christ? Is that all right? Yes, we have. So since You've been raised with Christ. Set your heart. This is something that you and I have to do. Amen. This is our job. He says, set your heart on what? Things above. Is that the instruction? Is that the command? Amen, somebody. He didn't say, set your mind on what has happened to you. He didn't say, set your mind on what you don't have. He didn't set your, he say, set your mind on who you're not. He says, set your heart, set your mind, set your, King James says, affection on things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. 
set your mind on things above, notice, not on earthly things. And that's why sometimes we're walking each and every day miserable, upset, depressed, and in despair because our minds are set on earthly things. What we don't have. What's happened to us. Who we're not. Amen, somebody. He says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Notice why. For you died. Herein lies the problem. Many of us fail to realize that now that we're in Christ, we're dead to ourselves. Amen, Amen somebody. For you, are, for you died and your life now is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ, notice, who is your life? Who is your life? You see, for many of us, we, we're struggling because we have yet to relinquish ourselves fully over to the Lord so that he can truly be our life. We're still holding a part, a percentage of our life for those things that we have an interest in, those things that are important to us. And what God is saying is, I'm going to allow you, because you're still taking a part of your life for yourself, I'm going to allow what you are holding for yourself to frustrate you to death. <laughs> Disappoint you on every hand. Since it's so important to you, amen, somebody, it's going to frustrate you to death because you'll never be able to have control in it until you recognize that I'm in control. And until you yield that over to me, it's going to frustrate you to death. So he says, Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. So understand when we talk about the greatness of the new thing that God has already done. He's already given his son. All right. But notice this. This is along with the fact, and I was just talking about this with my wife. This is along with the fact that you and I have actually received it and are privileged to be a part of it. We are blessed to be in Christ and in his kingdom. What we looked at earlier from Isaiah 43, he was prophesying about. Amen, somebody. He was prophesying about the coming Messiah, the greatest thing that God would ever do. Amen, somebody. But he wasn't able to see it. We are in it. You say, well, what happened to Isaiah? History tells us Isaiah, according to Hebrews chapter 11, at the end, history tells us that Isaiah was sawed in half. And he was faithful unto death. But he didn't see the promise come. We're in the promise. Ain't nobody trying to saw us in half. Amen, somebody. They may do it with words and everything else, but we ain't got to the point where they're persecuting us like that. But it happens to our brothers and sisters throughout the world. But God be praised. Amen. As many problems as we got with this nation, God be praised. We still have the liberty to worship God, to serve God without persecution yet. I would hate to think if we would renounce God if somebody warned us or threatened us with being sawed in half. So you say, well, why do you say all this? Because we're privileged to be a part of Christ and his kingdom. We often take that for granted. And I'm here to tell you, as we are in the first day of a new year, you and I must now, more than ever before in our lives, endeavor to become singularly focused. Did y'all hear me? More than any other time of your and my life, 
we must endeavor to become singularly focused. Because Satan, we're not ignorant of his tactics. Satan is just not working in sin. He wants to distract us from what's really important in our lives. And a lot of us aren't focused because we got too much going on. Y'all ain't get that. And that's why I want to call your attention to Philippians 3.13 in our remaining time. Briefly, Philippians 3.13, where the apostle, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives you and I one of the best exhortations that we can ever receive. And he gives us that from his own testimony. Amen, somebody. Notice what he says, Philippians 3.13. He says, brethren... I count not myself to have apprehended. Now, you would think that if anyone could, could think that they have obtained or arrived, it would have been Paul. But he tells us from his own testimony, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. What does that mean? That means as I live right now, I do not consider myself to have obtained Obtain what? That for which the Lord Christ Jesus has called me into his kingdom and service. All right? In other words, Paul is saying, there is something for which I am still striving after each and every day, and I've not yet obtained it. Amen, somebody. You say, well, what is that? It's the crown of glory. Amen, somebody. He goes on to say, not counting myself to have apprehended it, but this one thing I do. Did y'all get that? This, how many things? Many things. Plenty of things. This one thing I do. Why is this critical? It's critical for you and I to see that Paul clearly had one great aim. One purpose of life. In other words, he's, as our title suggests, he was singularly focused. And he, uh, what he's saying here infers that he made it a point. He said, this one thing I do, this is what I do. This is my point in life. He, he's saying, and it infers that he made it a point not to attempt to mingle the world and his faith. Did y'all get that? We have to be careful not to mingle the world with our faith in order that we are not trying to obtain both of them at the same time because Jesus still said in Matthew chapter 6, no man can serve two masters. Amen, somebody. We're going to have to choose. That doesn't mean that we live life as monks and hermits and things like that. We still have a life to live, but we understand that our faith comes first. So his focus was not up to obtain wealth and honor and prestige and all this other worldly stuff and salvation too. Amen, somebody. You see, he was singularly focused on the one object, the one aim, and the one great purpose of his soul. Because we can get a lot of things in life, but what about your soul? What about your soul? And that's what I want us to know real quick, that a Christian, notice this, a Christian will accomplish little who allows his or her mind to be distracted by a multiplicity of the objects, cares, and concerns of this life. Did y'all hear that? If we allow ourselves to be distracted by the objects, the cares and concerns of this life, you and I won't accomplish much for God. And this is why 2 Timothy 2 in verse 4 says this, and this is from a different translation. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. For then they cannot please the officer 
who enlisted them. Amen, somebody. How does this apply to us? Christ has enlisted us to his service as our master. And he's saying, if we get tied up into the affairs of civilian life, we can't please him who enlisted us to be a soldier. Amen, somebody. And not only that, a Christian will accomplish nothing who does not have a single great aim and purpose, notice, for their soul. And this is why Paul in Galatians chapter 2 and the verse 20 got to a point in life where he says, I have been, I have been, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You say, well, Mark, what's, what's the point of all this? The point is, you and I must continue to work. We must continue to endeavor purposefully, intentionally, to make securing the prize, eternal salvation, eternal life, the goal and the sole purpose of our lives. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be insensitive. I'm not trying to say that we don't have goals and things in life, but that can't be our main goal. Our main goal has to be for our souls to be saved. And God has already done his part, the greatest part, in giving his son. So if our souls aren't saved, guess what? It's your own fault. Amen. Are we getting this? You see, the truth of the matter is, the only way for you and I to truly do this is to always have in view that great object to such a degree that we avoid everything and anything that would interfere with that goal. And guess what that includes sometimes? Your desires, family, careers. If it interferes with the great objective of life, we have to cut it loose, y'all. If it's going to hinder me in any way, shape, or form from seeing God in peace, that's why Jesus said we ought to cut off our right arm. If your right arm offends you, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. In other words, anything that's going to hinder you, anything that's going to impede upon you, making it to heaven, you better deal with it. Because some of us are too preoccupied uh, with making a living that we forget about that we have to make a life. And have you ever noticed uh, as much as we get involved in all these things and careers and employments and things like that, we still got holes in our pockets. Yeah. I got this job now. You still got holes in your pockets. You still ain't got enough. What is God trying to tell you? You're working double time and overtime and you still don't have enough. As soon as you get it is as soon as it's gone. Amen, somebody. All right. So we have to be able to give those things up. Any way, anything that would be in the way of attaining eternal life. Hebrews 12, 1, y'all know it. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a, great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Another translation says it like this, since we are surrounded by so many examples of faith, we must get rid of everything that slows us down. Amen, somebody. And I'm here to tell you, we got some things, if we're honest about it, we got some things that are slowing us down, all right? We got some things that are slowing us down, and, and the devil tries to make us seem like, well, I got to do that. God understands that. 
God doesn't understand anything we put before him. Let, let's get that clear right now. Yes, sir. Say, well, God understands I got to do. Yeah, you understand that you're putting it before him. Amen. And he's been so good to you. He's given his son. All right. He says, especially the sin that distracts us, we must run the race that lies ahead of us and never give up. But notice as we close. That a part, a significant part of being singularly focused is not only what we just spoke about. It's not only what you and I strategically choose to aim towards, but it's also what we strategically choose to leave behind. Get this. Let me say that again. Significant part of you and I being singularly focused is not only what we strategically choose to aim towards, but also what we strategically choose to leave behind. Now that we're in 2023, there are some things that you and I are going to have to strategically choose to forget and leave behind. And this is why he says, forgetting, forgetting those things which are behind. Remember what he did just say, this one thing I do, this one thing I do. What's the one thing, Paul? Forgetting those things which are behind. And what he's alluding to is at that time they had uh, the Grecian races. Okay? And he's alluding to the fact that the one running the race to secure the prize would never stop and look behind. Are y'all getting this? Amen, somebody. They would never run the race, and stop to look behind to see how much ground they had or to look at the other competitors to see where they were in comparison to where he or she was. Amen, somebody. When is the last time you and I watched the Olympics and someone is running a sprint trying to go this way? It don't happen. It don't happen. You say, well, what are you saying about that? Because we have to understand, running the race, if their attention was diverted, even for a moment, it would cause them the opportunity to lose the crown. Looking back can cost you the victory. And for us, the victory is already won. For us, the victory is just finish the race. And we can't finish looking back. Ask Lot's wife about looking back. When God said, don't look back. Amen, somebody. Instead, the runner to win the prize would keep their eyes steadily on the prize and strain every nerve that they might obtain it. So this is what Paul is saying in regards to himself. He looked onward to the prize and fixed his eyes intently on that. It was the single object of his focus, the single object of his view. And he didn't allow his mind, notice this, he didn't allow his mind to be diverted as he ran. All right? He didn't allow it to be diverted from anything, not even a contemplation of the past, all right? And therefore, he didn't stop to think of the difficulties which he had overcome, the troubles which he had previously met, but he thought only of what was yet to be accomplished going forward. Amen, somebody. Now, let me qualify this again. doesn't mean that we don't have a contemplation of what God has brought us through. Because we need to have a contemplation always of what God has brought us through. Amen, somebody. We need that so that we can stay in a constant state of repentance, a constant state of thanksgiving and gratefulness for who God is. 
So we're not to forget what God has done for us. Amen. But, but what Paul is saying is that he strategically chose to forget here the things were behind, notice, good or bad. For the distinct purpose of not becoming content with his present efforts as if from his own perspective is, it is enough. In other words, you and I can run the risk of looking back to 2022 and say, oh man, you look, all the good things I did. You want to sit back and just you know, think about all the good things you did last year. Guess what? You can't operate on that this year. You've already done that. Remember today we talked about the daily bread. Some of us are try still trying to live on the bread that we had back uh, under Brother Winston. You already done that stuff. That stuff is over. You can't, you, you, that's just a reputation. You can't live on that stuff. Well, under Brother Hogan, I did this. Well, guess what? You did it and it's over with. What are you doing now? You can't live off of that. Sometimes we can't stand people always bringing up what they used to do. I used to do that. Well, nobody cares about what you used to do. What are you doing now? Amen, somebody. You can't even do that on your job. You can't even go on your job and say, give me a raise for what I used to do 10 years ago. No, they're saying, what is your performance now? You get a performance, amen, uh, evaluation yearly or annually or whatever. They don't, they don't go back and say, well, you know, back 10 years ago, you were doing great, so we're going to give you a raise. No, what are you doing now for the company? Are we getting this? All right. So looking back, it's, it's not beneficial. Get this. Looking back is not beneficial for us going forward. All right? Because we have a tendency uh, to look back and run the risk of being self-satisfied, trusting our past endeavors, feeling like our prize is secure, all right? Which would relax uh, our future efforts, feeling that like we've done enough, or or we can look at the bad, amen, somebody, and that's why it's good or bad. It's not good for us to look back at what we didn't do, amen, somebody, because I can look back at what I didn't do and then in the present feel like I'm unworthy to do anything for God. If God has you here, he has a work for you to do, no matter what you didn't do in the past, amen, somebody, and the devil is still lying to us still bothering us because we're more worried about what people think. And we're trying to impress people in the church except the head of the church, Christ Jesus. Don't we understand that we're not here for each other? We're here to glorify God. Amen, somebody. And some of us are scared to even come back sometimes because we're worried about what the people are going to say. No matter what the people say, we're all sick up in here. Even on our best day, we all need the grace of God. Is that all right? So this is why Paul finally says, and reaching forth, says this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are in the past and reaching forth unto those things which are before. In other words, get this. This is just amazing. Even with everything that Paul, the apostle, had seemingly accomplished for the cause of Christ, he recognized that he couldn't do enough. He never got to a point where, oh, man, I did enough. To his dying breath. He recognized that he couldn't do enough. Amen, somebody. And therefore, he's encouraging you and I to, consider, to continue to pursue the prize uh, with vigor, to endeavor to get more grace while never thinking that we have done enough. Guess what, church? There's still more for us to do. 
And this year, we want to glorify God even more. Say, so oh, man, we, oh, man, by, by the end of the year, 2022, we were serving over almost upwards to 200 people. Guess what? We want to do even more. Amen. Well, we were able to uh, save this many souls. We want to do even more. Amen. Well, I was able to, to uh, be more fit and meet for the masters. You, I, we can do even more. God wants us to get better and better and better for his glory, Amen. honor, and praise. Amen, somebody. Amen. This is why he finally says, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. I want to end with this because it will help us in recognizing what Paul is saying here in Philippians 3.13. 3, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 27. I'll, I'll wait for you there. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 and 27. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 20, 27. Paul says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one gets the prize. So run to do what? To win. Run to win. And I always ask the question, if you and I are not running with purpose, why are we even in the race to begin with? If you're not here, if I'm not here to see God in peace, what am I even in here for? Am I here for to be reminded once I see him and he says, depart from me, I never knew you, to know that I had a chance? That's going to be even worse. That will be even more, you know, terrible to know that I was a member of the body of Christ and I blew it. Because I was too concerned, too preoccupied, too caught up with life. And the desires of this life. I was trying to live to have the best life. Got all these people today. Live your best life. Your best life is in Christ. Because that's the only life there is. He says, run to win. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown. They do it. They do it to get a crown that will not last. In other words, in this game of life, some people are in it for their own motivations. But we're in this game of life, amen, because we're trying to win not a corruptible crown, we're trying to win an uncorruptible crown. Is that all right? But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, look at what he says, I do not run without a definite goal. I do not flail around like one beating the air, just shadow boxing. Imagine that. Imagine tra training for 30, 40 years just shadow boxing. You never get in the ring with nobody. <laughs> I'm the greatest. I'm a bad man. You've just been shadow boxing. What's the point? But notice he says, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. What are you speaking to, Paul? Are you speaking to this physical thing? No. He's really, when you really interrogate this tech, text, when he says, I discipline myself or discipline my body, he's talking about this thing. I discipline this and keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. As I said this morning, it, it would be a shame before God for us to have went through this Christian walk for years and on the way encouraged so many people and they make it and we don't. And we know better. We know better. We take all this pride in, in knowing the scriptures and rightly dividing the scriptures, but not to do it 
You're going to know what God said and be assured and believe it, and you ain't going to do it. you got to be up. I said enough. Consider where you are. For those who may be here tonight, any, we never want to take uh, for granted that everyone here is saved. So we always want to extend the invitation, the Savior's invitation, the greatest invitation ever known to man. You can come having heard the word. Do you believe it? If you believe it, are you willing to repent of your sins? Confess the name of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and in obedience be buried in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. You can do that tonight. For those of us who have obeyed, let's take heed to this message tonight that we need to be singularly focused. There's all types of distractions and those distractions those distractions, not necessarily sins, those distractions can keep us out of heaven just like the sin can. But only if you allow them to. Consider that as we together stand and sing the words of encouragement.